This video is part of the MCAT Chemistry video course. Subscribe if you'd like notifications about the release of new videos, and please visit ancientbrainstutoring.com for questions about one-on-one -on -one virtual MCAT tutoring. In this video, we're going to go over hybridization, and first we'll establish what electron groups mean, and then how that correlates to hybridization, and we're going to go over sp3, sp2, and sp1 hybridization. First, we need to establish what electron groups are, and electron groups are either lone pairs or bonded atoms. So I want to point out one thing really quickly. If we look on the figure to the right, so there's a double bonded element to that X. So X and Y are just placeholders. Um, those can be whatever elements you're working with. So Y is double bonded to X. And even though there's a double bond, that is still just considered one bonded atom. So that entire thing, that is just one electron group, the whole double bonded Y. So let's just count how many electron groups we have on each of these just to make sure that we're clear on this. So the first one on the left has three lone pairs and then one bonded atom. So that one has four electron groups. And then the one on the right has the Y that we've already circled, the double bonded Y. It's got the single bonded Y and then the lone pair. So the one on the right only has three electron groups. And atoms that obey the octet rule can have between two and four electron groups. One really notable exception is hydrogen, um, because hydrogen only wants a maximum of two elect electrons, so hydrogen is never going to have more than one electron group, and a lot of the times it's actually not going to have any, because uh, it loses its one electron very easily. So now we'll look at whenever an atom has four electron groups around it. So anytime that we have four electron groups around a central atom, that is going to be sp3 hybridized. And these four pictures that I have drawn here, these just correspond to these four bullet points. And each one of these has four electron groups on it. And they're just different combinations of lone pairs and bonded atoms. And by no means do you need to memorize these four combinations of four electron groups. I just drew these so that you can look at it and make sure you're really clear on what electron groups mean. And it is something you should be able to think through and come up with these images on your own though. Now we're gonna look at why does hybridization occur. And the following explanation is really MCAT specific. It's going to help you think through these types of problems and have an intuitive understanding that's going to help you memorize and work through problems. And we're not going to go into any more depth than, than what's going to be helpful for this test. And what we first want to establish is that all the electrons that are in these lone pairs or these bonds for any of these images, so all the electrons that are in what we've drawn for these images, those electrons are all from S and P subshells. And that kind of goes back to Lewis structures where we were using the valence electrons to make the structures. And all of those valence electrons were S and P electrons. And remember that S and P are two different subshells, which are separated by a decent amount of energy between them. So S electrons are in a different energy level than P electrons, for instance. But what we observe in these molecules that have four electron groups is that all of the electron groups, so whether it's lone pairs or bonds, all of the electrons that are in those groups have equal energy. And so that doesn't really match up with the idea of having all S and P electrons because S electrons and P electrons are different energy. So then they come up with this theory of hybridization to explain why all of the electrons are actually equal in energy. And they come up with the idea of SP3 hybridization, which means that the three P orbitals combine with that one s orbital to form the sp3 subshell and so that sp3 subshell has a total of four orbitals and those four orbitals can hold two electrons each which then means that the eight electrons that are surrounding our central atoms on those four images those eight electrons are all occupying the sp3 orbitals so now we have a perfect explanation for why we observe all of these electrons around the central atom being in the same energy level. And so hybridization is pretty much a way to take our electron configuration and then make it fit with what we've observed about atoms that have four electron groups. So the whole idea about those four electron groups having the same energy, that is more of an observation. That's not of our own creation. We've observed, observed that, and then hybridization helps to explain that while also being in line with things like electron configuration. Now we're going to look at when the central atom has three electron groups and is sp2 hybridized. And the three images here, just like the uh, example before, those three images correspond to these three bullet points. And these are just examples of 
the different ways that you can have three electron groups. And notice how whenever we have an atom attached to the central atom, if that atom is double bonded, it still just counts as one electron group. You want to make sure you are crystal clear on that idea. And these, again, are not things that I would memorize. I wouldn't memorize these three images. You should be able to come up with these and draw these just if you understand the idea of um, electron groups and these different hybridizations. So now let's look at why does something with three electron groups become sp2 hybridized. And the first thing that we're going to point out is that notice how in each of our examples we have a double bond. So each one of those has a double bond. And that's going to be necessary any time that you have only three electron groups and you're obeying the octet rule. Because if you only have three electron groups, you have to have a double bond in order for that central atom to have eight electrons. And that double bond helps to explain why the sp2 hybridization happens. So our observation and experiments is that one of the double bonds, the one that I just highlighted in blue, the electrons in that bond are equal to the other electrons that are bonded to the central atom. And it doesn't matter if the, those other ones are lone pairs or single bonds. So if we look at uh, image number two, this blue bond in that double bond, the, electron, the electrons in that are equal in energy to that, the electrons in that single bond and the electrons in the lone pair. And then same with this last one, all the bonds that are highlighted in that blue color, the electrons in those bonds are equal in energy. But then the other double bond, the one that's highlighted in the orange color, that is a different energy. The electrons in that bond are at a different energy level than all the blue highlighted electrons. So now we need an explanation on why we have six electrons that are equal in energy and then two electrons that are not equal in, it, in energy. And the way that we explain this is that two of the P subshell orbitals combine with the one S subshell orbital. So those three orbitals are going to combine to make the SP2 subshell which has three orbitals. And we're left with that, that P orbital up here, that remaining subshell, that remaining orbital in the P subshell is still left over. So what we're left with is one P orbital and then three SP2 orbitals, which is perfect because in the red highlighted bonds, there are two electrons in those, and those go into the P orbital, the remaining P orbital, which explains why they are not the same energy as the electrons that are in the sp2 subshell. So all the ones that are highlighted in blue, all of those electrons are sp2 hybridized. So now that gives us a perfect explanation for why all the blue electrons, those six electrons are the same energy level, but they're a different energy than the two electrons that are in the red highlighted bond. And whenever you have a bond whose electrons are in the hybridized subshell, those are called sigma bonds. So the blue bonds are called sigma bonds. And then the bonds that are highlighted red, so the electrons that are in the leftover P orbital, those ones are called pi bonds. And it's pretty easy to remember because it's just um, the electrons that are in the leftover P subshell. So P, just think of that as standing for pi. So those electrons are the pi bonds. For our last one, we're going to look at when we have two electron groups, and that one becomes sp hybridized. And once again, we have these three images that are representing um, three different ways that you can have two electron groups. And for all of these, you're going to need at least a triple bond, or you're going to need two double bonds. If your central atom is going to obey the octet rule, it's going to need either a triple bond or two double bonds. And so you can probably predict that for sp hybridization, one of the p orbitals and then the s orbital combine to form the sp subshell, which has two orbitals. So then our um, final configuration ends up being a P subshell with two orbitals and then an SP subshell that also has two orbitals. And like what we discussed with all the previous ones, the electrons that are in the P subshell, those electrons are going to be relatively equal in terms of energy. And then the electrons that are in the SP subshell are going to be relatively equal in terms of energy. So first let's look at what electrons would be in the P subshell. So those electrons will always be the ones that are participating in the double or triple bonds. And if it's a triple bond, it's going to be two of those bonds in that triple bond. So in both triple bonds, two of them, and you can choose whatever two you want, it doesn't matter. Two of those bonds are going to be in the P subshell. And then for number three, where we have two double bonds, one of each double bond, those electrons are going to be in the P subshell. 
and it can never be both of one double bond. So it has to be one of each double bond. So then the electrons that are in the P subshell would all be the ones that are highlighted in red. And that also means that all of those are also pi bonds. So that leaves the rest of the electrons to be in the SP subshell. And I'm just going to highlight what electrons those would be. So it would be the lone pairs and then the other bonds that are in the triple bond or the double bond. So it's the whatever bond we didn't highlight red, that one. And then single bonds as well will be in the SP subshell. So we end up with kind of this list of takeaways. And as we go through this list, you want to just be able to make sure that you could explain this list back to yourself. The first one is that pi bonds electrons always occupy the leftover p orbitals, which we proved in this one and we, we showed that in the other ones as well. And then sigma bonds electrons and lone pair electrons occupy the hybridized orbitals. So the electrons that we have in our hybridized orbitals there, those would have to either be part of sigma bonds or lone pairs. And then the other thing that we showed, if you go back and look at all of these double bonds that we looked at, all double bonds have one sigma bond and one pi bond. And then as we just showed with this one, all triple bonds have one sigma bond and two pi bonds. And then lastly, all single bonds will always be sigma bonds. And all of this stuff is really important for future topics like molecular and electron geometry and then things like conjugation. So really important to have a solid foundation so that you can apply it to future topics as well.